Thank you, Amy. Oh, you hear us talk a lot uh, about the world out there, and we call the world out there effect. And what is an effect, really? An effect is the experience that you and I are, are having, the way in which we interpret what's going on out there, the, the, the conflicts, the joys, whatever it might be. Uh, it's, it's the tangible form that we get smacked up against all the time. That's the world of effect. Everything that we see, everything that you read, everything that you watch, everything that you participate in. And what we come to understand through a metaphysical uh, path is that an effect doesn't just happen. It doesn't just like drop out of the sky. It isn't something that bewitched Twix or Nose and it's just there. Uh, an effect has its origin in a cause. So therefore you get cause and effect. And what is a cause? A cause is a mental choosing. It's a thought that you and I have and then we follow up that thought with a dedicated choice of energy and devotion. So you have a thought that you're not good enough and you go, ooh, I like that thought. So I'm going to devote myself to supporting the idea that I'm a worthless scumbag. And uh, even though you don't articulate those words, that thought has a life. It's an energy. And so it's in there. And so the more that you revisit that thought, guess what? Then, like a magnet, all of the effects of that start to show up. You get people who treat you poorly. You get all the kinds of circumstances that, that substantiate that thought. And so, and likewise, if you have a thought that I deserve that I, I'm, I have value, that my, my creativity has value. In fact, what it is that I create has an audience. So therefore, there are people out there who want what it is that I have to deliver. And the more that you keep revisiting that thought, and the more that you, you uh, put that energy into it and you keep initiating, initiating, and initiating that thought, then the movement of that attaches itself to an effect, and that becomes your experience. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, because when we talk about effect, you also hear me say sometimes that effect out there basically in and of itself is illusion. And you're going, hold on a minute. It's very real to me. What that person did to me, that's very real to me. Are you telling me that that didn't exist? What we're trying to differentiate and understand is that there is the human experience of effect, and then there is the spiritual or the divine experience of effect. And what's the difference? Well, the difference is this. There is no wavering in the spiritual effect. And by wavering, I mean there is never a time when there is not divine order taking place. There is never a time where pure, absolute love is the highest and best, the most vibrant, the most alive energy that is there in the moment. There is never a time when things aren't fair. The spiritual effect consistently supports the idea that it's all God all the time, 24-7, just like CNN, all right? <laughs> all the time, all the time. That's the spiritual aspect of effect. The human definition of effect is very different. Because of what it wants us to lead is that sometimes things are good, but sometimes things are bad. And so when we are operating from the human aspect of effect, then that's where we start to talk about that as illusion, meaning that it's only real based upon going back to cause those thoughts that we are initiating. And so that means that the power is in your court. That means that if you don't like the human realm of the effect, then you have options. You have the, bil the ability to say, okay, I get to take responsibility for this. And let me stop and tell you that walking this spiritual path, where you are now, is, 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 not, is not chump change. This is the heavy-duty stuff. This is real, what I call real spiritual maturity. This is where you are not projecting upon the world what happened to you, but you are actually stepping back 
and being willing to examine and going, what part did I play in this? And see, sometimes we want to do it when it's convenient. And sometimes it doesn't, it's not very convenient, is it? But imagine, imagine getting to such a level of maturity that that becomes our automatic reflex where we go, okay, if what I understand about cause and effect and what I'm experiencing is effect, then somehow my cause has to be in the equation. And I'm willing to take responsibility for that. And by doing so, I gain back all of my power. All of my power returns to me in, in just floodgates opening because I've no longer given somebody else my power. I've no longer made somebody else responsible for my well-being or my employment or my happiness or my love because I realize that I am my point of power and that when we talk about the fact that it's all God, then I own my place in the all. And so there's never a time, there's never a circumstance, there never has been and there never will be when I will be abandoned, left alone, or dejected because I am a part of the spiritual understanding of effect. And so when we start to look at that, we, we, we engage in um, what we call the tangibles, and the tangibles are spiritual practice. Let's face it, life is in the human part, is mystery. And you get to love it or you get to resist it. But imagine if you already knew the ending to every movie, would you ever go to the movies? Imagine you buy the ticket, right? And if, if you like scary movies, you go, oh, don't tell me, don't tell me what happened. Because you want the thrill, you want the, the, the juice that flows through your body when you're experiencing that. Imagine if everybody... You already knew the ending. You already knew exactly what was going on. You'd be kind of bored, right? So that's the beautiful part about the mystery. But what do you know about the mystery? What's the key to the mystery? The key to the mystery is it's all going to work out. And so what are you going to do between now and it's all going to work out? Are you going to love the mystery or are you going to loathe it? Are you going to accept it and allow it? Or are you going to keep resisting it? Which only makes the destination to the, it's already worked out just harder. Why complicate things? And so when we look at the effect, when we look at the mystery, when we look at the opportunity to create spiritual practice, then what happens for us is we call busting through the veil, through the veil of illusion. Many of you have done that. Numerous times. Busting through the veil of illusion means that you bust through the false idea that's been holding you back. Or you bust through the fear. You've all been in fear at times about something mysterious. But what happens is, is that you bust through the veil, you have the experience, you show up, it's no longer a mystery, you realize it's all going to be okay, and that which used to cause you fear now is just standard practice for life. And so when we start to, to understand that, then we are constantly busting through these veils of illusion, right? And so sometimes what we do is, if we're not aware of it, we feel like we want to get away from the veil as much as possible. We want to get away from the obstacle. We want to get away from the person. We want to distance ourselves from all that uncomfortability. But today, when you see and you understand about the veils of illusion, what if, what if you brought them with you? It's different than bringing your story, your, your debilitating story. What I'm saying is you're bringing your experience with you. And by bringing your experience with you, what you are showing, what you are a testament to, is the power of cause and effect. The understanding of that, the resilience of that, the eternal resurrection that is you in that. And when you start to see that, then it's really, really in alignment with our authenticity to say, I honor it all. Do you see, do you see the value in saying I honor it all? 
to be able to look at every single experience and realize it was that experience that made you choose or that propelled you to where you are in this moment. It was what brought dissatisfaction. It was actually what instilled anger within you that made you choose something else. But when you can look back at all of those veils and you going through those veils, what I wanted to offer you today is the experience of bringing the veils with you and dance with them. Dance of the eternal veils, right? We take these veils, we take these veils, and we build our present day consciousness from them. So I was reading this quote from Neil Donald Walsh, and see if you can follow this. He said, nothing can be experienced in the absence of its opposite. Download, digest. Nothing can be experienced in the, apos- in the absence of its opposite. So, for example, you get a greater understanding of what love and acceptance is when you've had the emotion of hatred and you've experienced rejection. You follow? How do you really understand the value, the depth, the exhilaration of love unless you've had the other end of the stick happen to you? How do you really understand and appreciate light unless you and I have had our metaphoric darkness? How do you really understand and appreciate the value of clean streets until you've had a polar vortex come in and landlock you somewhere. And then all of the sudden, the appreciation of physical mobility and going to the grocery store and getting across town and all of those kinds of things, it's like a whole new breath of fresh air. But those are the things that you and I took for granted until that happened. And so it's about not only learning the lesson, but then taking the lesson and letting the lesson start to have root within us so that every single thing then becomes something that is equated to appreciation and awareness. So we get to look back at the hurt and the pain and we say, thank you, thank you. We get to look back at all of the trepidation and all of the mystery and all of the fear and say, thank you. And see, I always believe that the universe conspires. There's that old quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson that, this, that says, the universe conspires. It conspires for your highest good. And sometimes, who gets in the way of our highest good the most? David Michael. Uh, no. <laughs> we do, ourselves, right? And so if the universe is conspiring for our highest good, How does it sometimes get our attention? You know, it's that cosmic two-by-four that says, wake up. Sometimes it is, perhaps maybe it's an illness, or it's an event, or it's getting fired. Because for some reason, we're not listening at the level that we're being asked to listen. And if the universe is conspiring for our good, then these events come to us in order to propel us propel us forward. I used to love to talk about how horrible my childhood was. I used to love to engage people in that conversation. And I used to, you know, tell all of these stories about my rageaholic mother and all of the things that she did and how hideous that experience was. And I'll never forget, years and years and years ago, I was in Cusco, Peru, and I had hiked the Inca Trail, and I had finally gotten into Machu Picchu, and then I went to Cusco. And I was there for the entire month of June. And June is big festival month in Peru. And there's a, a, there's a square, a town square in Cusco, like there's in a lot of those European towns. And at the Cathedral of Santo Domingo, every single night, there were all of these children who were out dancing and celebrating and in, in getting ready for... The, uh, the, the summer uh, eclipse, what, what? Solstice. solstice, the summer solstice, so, because there's big celebrations. And so 
All these different age levels of children would be practicing their dances because they would get some kind of school reward or something, whoever won. And so some nights I would go and I would just watch and watch all these different levels of children dancing in the square. And one night I was sitting there and there were some like seven, eight-year-olds and they were going around in this circle, and my, my attention was immediately drawn to the back of this little boy's head. And as he began to circle around, lo and behold, that little boy was me. And no, I wasn't smoking ayahuasca. I was sitting there. And I looked, and this little boy looked at me, and this is what he did. He went, And he winked at me, and he was smiling, and he was dancing, and I was frozen, just absolutely frozen in that moment. And he kept going around, and I couldn't take my eyes off of him. And every time he would go around, he would giggle, and he would laugh. And I saw in that moment that my childhood is what I make it. Meaning, you know the phrase, it's never too late to have a happy childhood? If you and I are always belaboring and bemoaning about something in our life, we're missing the fact that it was that thing, that moment in time, that era that was a training ground for moving us to the next and to the next. In fact, as I sat there, I went, oh my God, it was that family environment that instilled within me the desire to be a seeker. And it was in that seeking that made me want to see the world. And it was in wanting to see the world that brought me to Cusco, Peru. And it was in being in Cusco, Peru that let me see my eight-year-old boy in joy. I could never equate being a boy and being in joy. But there it was. Don't ask me how to explain that, but it happened. And what I notice is that there are moments then in our lives, if we're paying attention, there's actually a word for it which gets translated to mean thin space. And thin space is the idea that the delineation between that which is the ethereal, that which is heaven, and that which is the density of earth is so small that you can't differentiate between the two. It's like we're wafting back and forth. And imagine being able to have the awareness and the consciousness to be able to see the effects of the world and be in thin space, meaning like, ah, oh, look at that. Isn't that fun? Look at that supposed conflict. But realizing that it's not conflict at all, that it's just beautifully working itself out, and that you and I have the opportunity to see God in everything. I wasn't able up until that point to say that I could see God or find the good in that upbringing. But it was that moment of watching me go around in that circle that showed me and told me if I was willing to see the good in everything, it will show up. If you are willing, if you are willing to see the divine in whatever portion or history of your life, you will see it. That's the beauty of cause and effect. If you are devoted to living in a world that works, the effect will come around and what you will have and experience is a world that works. But you and I have to be devoted to that. You know that lovely Japanese proverb that says, fall down seven times, stand up eight. I love that. Because that's indicative of the fact that if we keep showing up, if you keep showing up with the intention of seeing the, the spiritual aspect of effect, then you will see it. During those snow days, I, I turned the television on and I was watching, there were all these movies on there that I hadn't had a chance to see. So I watched Captain Phillips. I don't know if you saw that. I'm not giving anything away because you know how it ended because it's a real story. So, uh, but in the end, when he's finally rescued... And they're taking Tom Hanks in, and he's in shock. And, and, and he's trembling, and he's, and he's crying, and they're just trying to take care of him. 
there's this beautiful juxtaposition where he's saying, tell my family I love them. Tell my family I love them. Tell my family I love them. And it doesn't make any sense unless you saw the beginning of the movie where it was just kind of wrote, he, he was going off on another cargo expedition. His wife drops him off at the airport. Kiss on the cheek, see you later kind of thing. And we're all, we're all in those moments of kiss on the cheek, see you later kind of mentality. And it isn't until there's an effect sometimes that grabs our attention that makes us want to go, tell my family I love them. Tell those people around me that I appreciate them. Tell everybody around them how much they mean to me and what they were able to give to me. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And so you start to see the beauty and the power of effect. You start to see the beauty and the power of busting through the veils and letting those things wake us up. Wake us up to the richness of life. And I was just so happy when the credits were rolling and then they, they tell you, you know how they always say, and now this is what's happening to Captain Phillips. And it said, after a year, basically of recuperating from that really amazing piracy and kidnapping, he was back on the sea in 12 months. And I went, yes. Because to me, what that says is, what did he do? He took the veil with him. He took the veil with him. Imagine, we will never know, but imagine all of the people who were in his team. Can you imagine what they must have looked at him like? What they must have thought about him to have known what he went through and to see him back at the helm of a cargo ship. And see, every single one of us are Captain Phillips. Every single one of us has the ability to step it up and to understand the power and the potency of who and what you are. So I have a, a book coming out this year, and in one of the, one of the chapters I, I, I created this story um, to sort of illustrate this point. And it's a, I, I chose a, a man who makes pots out of clay. And so I tell this story about the man goes to the riverbank and he digs the clay by hand and he takes all of the grass and all of the pebbles out of it and he takes the clay and he, and he fashions it into these pots and he has this mold and these pots go into the kiln and then they come out and they're these you know, standard pots, but he's very proud of them because this is what his family has always made. Only one problem. No one is buying those pots. And so guess what his solution is? Work harder, make more pots. How many of us do that? <laughs> oh, this is not working out. Let me work harder. Let me not really stop and look and examine and go within. Let me just keep doing the same thing, but doing it in light speed. So he just makes more pots. Well, what happens with that is his shop all of a sudden is overrun with these towering stacks of clay pots and more clay pots and more clay pots to the point where there's no place to move. Even the windows are covered by piles of pots. So now it's dark in there, and inevitably, what happens in the situation, what did Emerson say? The universe conspires to get your attention. So he's walking through, he's inching his way through, and his foot hits one of the towers of pots, and down they go. And like dominoes, it just hits one more tower, and one more tower, and one more tower, until all of these stacks of clay pots come tumbling to the ground. And it's not until that moment that he has a real, real authentic emotion. And it's sadness. And it's the frustration. And it's the anger. It's all the things that he's masked over because he's been so busy making pots. And so finally in that moment, he just sits and he weeps. And he doesn't have the heart to throw any of these fragments away. So he picks them up and he's putting them in these burlap bags until all of a sudden, finally, he can see some areas in his shop and there are these old tubes of gold filigree. And so he goes over and he looks at them and suddenly a, a divine idea downloads. And he goes, what if 
And he starts to take the pieces and he starts to glue them back together with these gold filigree. And all of the sudden now, these standard look-alike pots suddenly are one of a kind. Because as he's rearranged them and put them together, they have these beautiful gold veins that are running through. And he sets them out in front of his shop to dry. And no sooner does he set them out than the door starts hearing, you know, loud knocking from people. And they go, I want one of these. And so he hasn't even taken them to market. And people are already wanting them. And so he sells what he just put out. And then he goes in, he glues more, and the door knocks. And, and he's like gluing as fast as he can. And everything that he puts out there, the world wants. There's a receptive audience. And the moral or the metaphor behind the story is that we're much like that artisan. We get so caught up in wanting to do things uniformly like everybody else that we cut ourselves off from our emotional state. We deny our past and everything that it took to get there, we sanitize things so much that we forget the beauty of our path. And we have forgotten what that pain did to us. We have forgotten the way in which we had to, to, to find our resiliency and to honor all of that because that's the thing that brought us here in this moment. And so when we're able to not just go through the veil, but to take the veil with us, then we can begin to see how powerful we are and that there is no effect out there whatsoever that can do or diminish or degrade or damage us unless we create a corresponding cause or thought that is going to allow that to happen. And so when you and I understand this, and I don't mean just intellectually, when we understand it and then it downloads, it integrates itself into us so that it becomes a part of our spiritual practice. I've told you this before, there is no stopping you. And that's what we're here to do. Please don't confuse what I just said by taking your story and showcasing it as your identity. That's not your identity. It's just been a portion of what allowed you to get to where you are. There's a difference. You are not the pain. You are someone who experienced the pain and through consciousness, allowed the pain to propel you to a greater sense of aliveness. And so as we know this together, what I want to encourage you to do is to look at those words, honor the entirety of your journey. Honor the entirety of your journey. And if you are willing to do that, your whole sense of well-being will see the light of day. If you'll know with me this morning as we go within. Just take a deep breath. How blessed we are how wise we are, how strong and powerful we are. That we actually chose to come and to be in this world at this time, to have all of these experiences and continue to show up day after day. And now what we understand is that our days are our days are colored by the way in which we view them. That our experiences and the effects around us are not something that overpower us, but they are simply an outpicturing of the mental inner atmosphere of who and what we are. 
So we rededicate ourselves to our mental atmosphere. Allowing ourselves to always be on the lookout for the good. To really understand what it means to know that solution already does exist. To get that it's already been created. And that we are continuously uncovering everything that we need. And knowing that it is there. As we just give ourselves a moment of luxury to feel relief. Then we know that that relief is matched through the beautiful creative medium, the energy that says it is done unto us as we believe. It is my prayer and my affirmation that we don't do this alone. That as we strengthen our own personal process, we assist and support others in their process as well. That we get that we are connected. That we understand the beauty and the power that is ours for the asking. And so in this moment now, I know that individually and collectively, we are changed at depth and that we experience all of that which has been classified and named as the kingdom because the kingdom is within us. May we love ourselves enough that we can love others. Knowing this to be our truth, we take a deep breath in and together we say, and so it is.